I'm going to be responding to Kingma's um, presentation. And we can summarize uh, Elsa Line's view as follows. There is something like a um, placenta uterine cord foster mariological hole which grows directly out of the uterine wall just as a tail grows out of the cat. And I'm quoting the paper Pregnant Mariology now. Therefore, it follows that the foster post-implantation and prior to birth is a part of the mother. And she gives various reasons, which, uh, again, I will explain in due course. Now, the alternative to this parthood view that she discusses, which is a, an alternative which I embrace and which we defended in the 16 days paper uh, is called the fetal container view which says that the fetus is inside the mother but not a part of the mother and um, uh, through her papers and also at various points during her presentation today points where she uh, tended to raise her voice and become very passionate um, this fetal container view, container view is, she says, a view no one has ever argued for. And she thinks this is a mark against it. All right, now the chief witness is an octopus, the Ar Ar Argonaut, and what uh, Kingma refers to as its detachable penis. But actually, if you look at the literature on the Argonaut, it's called a detachable modified arm. And Kingma, uh, in her way, wanted to, to see this as being uh, an archetypical male thing to worry about detached penises, but we don't actually worry very much about losing arms. Uh, a hectotillus, it says, is one of the arms of male cephalopods that is specialized to store and transfer sperm to the female. And now comes the polite part. Depending on the species, the male may use it merely as a conduit to the female, or he may wrench it off and present it to the female. <laughs> if you're an octopus, you can do these things. Um, the idea is that we can learn something about metaphysics from the case of the Argonaut, namely that there can be t detachable organs. And the idea would be then that the foster is a detachable organ, so it would be like a kidney which lives a life of its own once it's been detached from its host. King Matt holds the view that there are some parts, not organs, but some parts of the um, organism, an organism like ourselves, which do not persist through separation, such as the heart or the brain, and other parts which do persist through separation, and... Um, th these would include, the, the, the um, on her view anyway, the foster, the fetus, embryo, baby inside the mother. Uh, I agree that there are some parts which can survive. Many molecules survive. Uh, in fact, all molecules, I guess, survive in one way or another that we lose in the course of our lives. So it's certainly true that there are parts. The question is whether there are organs, and the question is whether the, uh, the foster is to be regarded under this heading which can survive and become what uh, embryos do, namely uh, mature adults, if they're lucky. When I read Kingma's, uh, sorry, Elsa Line's uh, writings on these matters, she repeatedly cites the paper 16 days. She only ever cites one sentence, which is a sentence about a tub of yogurt. Now, the, um, the, the 16 days... A fetal container view is also called the, the tenant niche view. We regard the foster as a tenant in the niche which is created by the mother through the uterus. We give us some examples of the niche tenant relation, one of which is the relation between a tub of yogurt and the inside of your refrigerator. She suggests that we'd never heard of the um umbilical cord and the placenta when we wrote the paper. Of course, we'd heard about the fact that the umbilical cord is connected to the placenta at one side and is connected to the baby on the other side. And she says that this means that the foster mother relation or the foster uterus relation cannot be a niche tenant relation because the baby shares an external boundary with the umbilical cord. 
She also thinks that given that the placenta has a maternal part and a fetal part, there must be an overlap or there must be parts in common between the baby and the fetus. But that's not true, of course, because the fetal part of the placenta and the um, maternal part of the placenta are two different layers within one and the same organ. They are separated from each other also by some liquid or fluid filled cavity, as we will see ad nauseam in the next few minutes. So it's really only number two, which is a problem, but it's not a problem if you read the paper. Um, now, there are two cases that we need to distinguish. One is the future baby view, where we're considering whether the future baby could be the tenant inside the niche, which is the uterus. The other is the placenta uterine cord foster view. So this is the future baby view. And this is what we said in 16 days. So the issue, remember, is whether they share an external boundary. Each substance possesses its own complete connected external boundary, analogous to the surface of a sphere or torus. We are, of course, toruses because of our digestive tract. Each substance possesses its own complete connected external boundary, which divides its interior from its exterior and at the same time separates it spatially from other substances. The future baby has its own external boundary. The mother has her own external boundary, and on this view, the interior boundary of the uterus, or the amniotic cavity, we'll come back to that uh, later, is the relevant external boundary, which is not shared by the fetus. It's separated by liquid from the fetus. So... Because the external boundary very often will have pores and other gaps and still be an external boundary. The external boundary is established via a physical covering or membrane which extends continuously across all or almost all of its surface. Almost all because there, typically there are small apertures, pores, nostrils, your mouth for instance. The fact that you have a mouth which has a hole in it doesn't mean that there is, you don't have an external boundary. The fact that there are some organisms which are connected to other entities, for instance, uh, uh, somebody walking in space is connected to the spaceship, or somebody inside a spaceship is connected by the spaceship itself by various tubes and connectors, doesn't mean that the, the spaceship and the astronaut have suddenly become biologically one thing, so that the astronaut would be a part of this unified spaceship astronaut whole, nor when somebody uh, is in an ICU, which has been sealed off from the rest of the environment for immunological reasons, and is connected by breathing tubes, does it mean that the, the patient in the ICU has somehow become part of the ICU, rather than, as we can all see, standing, or in this case lying, in a niche-tenant relationship to the niche which is created by the ICU and to the uh, regulation of the person's um, oxygen needs and so forth which the ICU provides in virtue of the various connectors and tubes which are connecting to the patient. Now it's very easy, well it's relatively easy to disconnect those tubes. It's relatively easy to disconnect the tubes even of the astronaut, providing he's careful when, or she is careful when, when climbing back into the spaceship. Similarly, it's, easy, it's made easy, not by biology in this case, but by technology. It's very easy to separate two stamps, because stamps have perforations. Now, there are some bodily connections which are similarly easily separated. For instance, blisters. The idea that uh, Elsa Line has to defend is that when the foster, on one view, or the foster plus umbilical cord plus placenta, on the other view, leaves the mother, then a st substantial change occurs. Now, in the 16 days paper, we explain at great length what a substantial change is. Substantial change is not moving location. It's not changing the things that you're attached to. It's not being viewed by 
people in a different way. So on on one day they view you as such and such, on another day they view you as something else. It's something which is catastrophic. The two drops of water merge and flow into one. An amoeba splits, a block of marble is split and becomes two, or a pair of conjoined twins is separated. These are big changes. Moving out of the niche, in other words, becoming born, is not a big change. It's just moving from one place to another. So it's like the tenant leaving her apartment or the passenger leaving her car. On the future baby view, at least, it's not a case of substantial change. But on the uh, chorionic content growing directly out of the uterine wall, just as the tail grows out of the cat, it does look catastrophic. It does look as if it could be uh, a case like a block of marble splitting into two. There's a lot of blood. It's painful. And so um, Elsa Line argues that we are dealing here with a real boundary and that breaking this re of the sort which uh, the breaking of which would bring, a, bring about a substantial change. And so she uses the argument that because of the blood, it's more like separating the tail from a cat, which is not a non-trivial break. It's not like tearing two stamps down the perforation. It's something much more substantial than that. In the normal case, in fact, the placenta does detach easily. There's a lot of blood, but then there's a lot of blood in menstruation too. If there is a problem in detaching the placenta and thereby also in detaching the umbilical cord, from the mother. That's because there is something abnormal. It's because something's gone wrong. It's a mark of something going wrong that the, the, the placenta doesn't detach easily. Normally, it detaches easily with a lot of blood. All right, so this is how it looks. There is the future baby connected to the placenta via the, uh, uh, via, uh, via the umbilical cord, which is connected in turn to the placenta. There is a... Um, fetal part of the placenta, there's a maternal part of the placenta, and there is a perforation kind of boundary here, not a fiat boundary, which it would imply no physical discontinuity, but a bona fide boundary because the lining of the uterus is a physical discontinuity as between the placenta and the mother. My idea with the niche-tenant relation or the tenant-niche relation is captured rather conveniently in a series of, uh, of papers and articles about the microbiome. So 100 trillion good bacteria call the human body home. They are all standing to the human body in the tenant-niche relation. They're all tenants. Some of them are friendly tenants. Some of them are pathogens, and we want to get rid of them. The baby is like that. So we need to understand what it is to be in your home. And that's a very complicated relation. One of the argument strategies which Elsa Line uses is to suggest that by viewing the relationship between the baby and the mother as a niche-tenant relation, we are making it sound much too simple. We are neglecting all the processes of regulation, many of which are catered for by the placenta, which, as she quite rightly points out, is an amazingly sophisticated organ. All those processes of regulation are in operation precisely on the tenant-niche view, just as they're in operation in your apartment, regulating the, the temperature of the air, regulating the um, availability of water and electricity and internet connections and so forth. So the ho a home, whether it be the home of the baby inside the mother or whether it be home of the home of the tenant inside its apartment, is a regulated environment with all kinds of functional connections to the outside world through all kinds of engineered equipment. And so these are some examples of engineered equipment. They all have functions and they're all part of the home. They're part of the home because they are functionally connected to the workings of the home. And this, the workings of the home may include also security. So the, the, the reason why the amnion, the, the structure which houses the tenant we call the baby is so complicated is because it's serving the purpose of keeping the baby safe. That's why there are so many layers. I'm back to the ICU again. So your body houses 10 times more bacteria than cells. Your body is home. So these are all indications 
everywhere in the biological literature of the niche tenant relation as applied to bodies and things like bacteria. And you find it also in the literature on gynecology all over the place. Elsa Line just didn't see it. Trillions upon trillions of tiny passengers, bacteria. When the baby gets out of the womb, it's like a passenger getting out of the car. It's not a substantial change. It's, it's, it's a painful operation, but it's not a substantial change. So what makes a part? First of all, we're interested in parts on the inside of the organism, like the tub of yogurt in the roof. Being connected is not good enough. You could have uh, refrigerator magnets which are connected to your fridge, but that wouldn't make them parts of the fridge. In fact, you can be a part of the fridge without being connected. There can be movable parts of the fridge. What makes a part most importantly is having a function. And Elsa Lang sort of understood that in her way a bit. But she didn't provide a definition of function. And we provided a definition of function, which you can look at here. And it would be interesting if people have counterexamples of entities with functions which do not satisfy this definition. Basically, what it says is that an object Y has a function means it has a disposition in virtue of the way it's built physically. And that entity came into existence through historical processes which selected for entities capable of realizing that disposition. And there are two ways that can happen. One is intentional design for artifacts like refrigerators and motor cars. And the other is evolutionary selection for biological entities. I don't know of any other way in which functional, sorry, in which entities with functions come into existence. So two th kinds of things have functions, artifacts and the component parts of artifacts and parts of organisms. I do not believe that organisms have functions unless you believe in slavery or unless you follow Richard Dawkins and thinks that we are just the functional artifacts created by genes in order to propagate themselves through the universe. I don't accept them, either of those. So I can't think of any other reasons why organisms could be functions. Any organisms, whether bacteria or human beings. It could be that we manufacture bacteria and that we create artifacts, and then they would have functions because we design them for a certain purpose, to perform a certain function. But I can't think of any other ways in which biological entities can have functions other than being parts of organisms. Your heart has a function. Your kidney has a function. Your baby doesn't have a function because it's an organism. Therefore, your baby is not part of, of an organism because it doesn't satisfy that has a function relation. Now, in fact, what makes a part in the biological case is much more complicated. And that, that we could divide it into two questions, namely... The part question for small molecules, so banana molecules, when, you, when you've half digested a banana, are the banana molecules parts of you or not? That's a very difficult kind of question. There are many questions like that which are difficult. Fortunately, we're, we're interested in parthood for large granularity entities like fetuses, even very small fetuses are much larger than small molecules. And so we can make progress here. In the biological case, being on the inside is clearly not enough, again. So a bullet inside your body is not part of your body. Being connected is not so relevant. So all the parts of your organism are indeed connected to the other parts, except for blood cells. Blood cells are the only freely moving parts of your body. But they're parts, and all biologists accept the blood cells are parts of your body. So what makes a part? Well, it can't be having a function either because prostheses have functions, but prostheses are not parts. Hair satisfies the criterion of having a function whose realization is necessary for the host's continued existence, or at least did originally satisfy that function before we had home heating and air conditioning and so forth. Microbiota are not parts. The embryo is not a part if the embryo is an organism. So could the embryo be something like an organ of the mother so that it could satisfy this criterion? Because an organ has a function. In fact, that's part of the definition of what an organ is. For Elsa Line to get her way, we have to find a way of recognizing that the 
embryo has a function, and so it, that it can be the, an organ of the mother. It has to be a function which contributes to the mother's continued existence, or something like that. In her talk today, Elsa Lang told us what the function of the foster is. And I, I think this is the weakest point in her entire book. It says the function of the foster is to perform the reproductive function of the gravida. Now, I don't, I don't think this makes sense. I don't think it makes sense to say that the function of one entity is to perform the function of another entity. The whole point of having a function is that you have to perform it. All of these things are things which have functions of their own. So what she said is a bit like saying the function of this biscuit is to enable the performance of the cooking function of my stove or of my chef. Or the function of this gash is to enable the performance of the slashing function of my scimitar. Or the function of this engine air filter is, enabled to, is to enable the performance of the engineering function of the automobile engineer. It just doesn't make sense. But there is a fourth criterion, because we saw processes have functions which contribute to the realization of the goals of the, uh, of the host, but they are not parts of the host. In order to be a part in the biological sense, the, the, the entity in question has to be generated by the coordinated expression of the organism's own genes. And that's a standard thesis from standard anatomy. That's, that's how they work out what the anatomical parts of the organism are. I'll give you cloned embryos, else line. But all other embryos are, on this criterion, not parts of the mother because they are not expressions of the mother's own genes. All right, so the reason why no one ever argued for the fetal container view is the same as the reason why no one ever argued for the view that 2 plus 2 equals 4. It's obvious. And the reason why it's obvious to all biologists is because all biologists know what mammals are. Mammals are amniota, which, which comes from the Greek for lamb. And it, it means an organism that lay, lays its eggs on land or retains the fertilized egg within the mother. So the key to understanding where Elsa Line went wrong is the egg. All amniota are characterized by having an egg which is equipped with an amnios or membrane. And the membrane is, is, is going to be a multi-layered membrane which enables certain kinds of exchange between the outside and the inside, protects the baby. And in mammals such as humans, these membranes include the amniotic sac that surrounds the fetus. So the amniotic sac is the niche and the fetus is the tenant. The chicken is the tenant, the egg, the interior of the egg is the niche. So this is where we are. We are amniota. These are the uh, chordates. There are many, many other chordates, but we are, we are here in the amniotic part of the chordates. And amniota include mammals, but they include all kinds of other stuff, including turtles and crocodiles. And all birds. But they lay eggs, remember, just like we do. So this is the anatomy of am an amniotic egg. There are 15 parts, and this is a crocodile egg. I, don't, I didn't count them up, but the yolk sac and the yolk are pretty obvious, and they're going to be present in every egg. And remember that the chicken egg is covered in many pores, which enable the chicken to breathe. It still has an external boundary. In amniotes that lay eggs, the shell of the egg provides protection while being permeable to allow oxygen exchange in mammals. Membranes that are homologous, that means they have a common evolutionary ancestor, to the extra embryonic membrane, membranes in eggs are present in the placenta. So that's humans, that's reptiles and birds. It's the same thing. They're both a niche with a tenant. One's inside the mother, one's outside the mother, laid. The, the placenta is a fantastic organ. It allows exchange of matter. So that's the placenta, and these are all amniota. And I rest my case. Be careful.